Um, so if you wouldn't mind just accepting the, the pop-up menu. Okay, so um, let me welcome you all here today to um, this session on the principles on responsible sovereign lending and borrowing. Um, it's a discussion that we feel is timeless because clearly uh, one needs to think of all sorts of ways to respond to what we are now starting to call in the UN a cascade of crises. So it's not only um, COVID and the climate, but it's also conflict. And of course, all of these together mean that we need to harness our resources as best we can. Now, just if I could just frame it very briefly before I introduce you to the director of the Division of Globalization and Development Strategies, Mr. Rich, Richard Colza Wright, um, let me just frame it very briefly for you. Um, we have been engaged uh, within UNCTAD on a number of projects um, which have been commissioned by the development account in New York. And the project that we've, we're featuring today is Response and Recovering, Mobilizing Financial Resources for Development. And within this uh, project, which began um, pretty much in sync with the advent of COVID, um, we have developed 10 work streams with a number of UN partners, including um, the Economic Commissions of Africa, Asia, and Latin America, and the Caribbean. And within that, we have been trying to look at ways in which developing countries in particular can mobilize resources for development in response to this wave of crises. Um, part of the work that we've done has associated with trying to ensure that we have countries have access to liquidity through things like the Global Financial Safety Net. We've also been revisiting aspects like development assess, uh, uh, debt sustainability assessments. Um, but we also felt it was really timely as to reconsider the principles. Um, these principles are soft law and they, the work around them was initiated in response to the last major crisis we can remember, of course, the global financial crisis. Um, they were published in 2012, but there has been a sense in which um, there's been less work done in recent years on how these principles can um, encourage the, the tango, which is um, debt uh, acquisition by countries and uh, credit provision by sovereigns and of course private, the private sector so that it's responsible, so that it's, it's sustainable. And so in that context, I would like to invite Richard uh, Kozel Wright, the Director of uh, Globalization and Development Strategies at UNCTAD, just to give us a few opening remarks. Over to you, Richard. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Penelope. And uh, apologies, I, I have to. I have a meeting with with the Indonesian delegation from the G20 to UNCTAD shortly, and and I have to attend that. And and it, I think, and I, 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 I'll pose it as a question to you, Finn, Actually, I, I think at one point we did try and get the G20 to pick up the principles on responsible borrowing and lending, and we never got. In sufficient traction from developing countries, I don't think to push that. But my, I, I think now might be might be an opportune moment, and perhaps India might be a good uh, uh, vehicle and country to to do that. So, so maybe there will be synergies between this meeting and the meeting that I have to I have to go to shortly. Uh, I mean, and I think for the reasons that Penelope said, it is a very opportune moment. Um, to revisit the principles given the way in which uh, sovereign debt stress is now clearly back on the international policy agenda. Um, you know, we have endlessly uh, written about the holes in the multilateral system in this regard. We don't have a, a, a fair or efficient system for handing, handling sovereign debt problems to the extent that they are handled. They are always handled too little too late. And many countries find themselves within a relatively small period of time back in the similar kind of position that they were in if they do go through some sort of uh, relief restructuring 
uh, exercise. And, and of course, that was that was true before COVID-19 uh, hit. It, it, it was intensified because of the COVID crisis. And with the war now in Ukraine and its consequences, a, a lot of developing countries are clearly um, in, a, in a pretty precarious position. I mean, just to, just to take the numbers, 20, if we take 2019, the year before COVID, 33 countries um, uh, were considered to be in or at high risk of debt distress by the World Bank. Um, so before COVID, there was already countries that were clearly facing very serious trouble. Four countries, I think, I think it's four countries that have defaulted uh, during the the, uh, the COVID uh, crisis. You know, the Argentina and Lebanon. You know, you know those. Um, we thought we, at least in the, at the beginning of the COVID shock, we expected actually more countries to find themselves in, in that position. And there was a number of reasons why uh, that didn't happen. But in most cases, I, I, think, I think it's fair to say now, a lot of those countries essentially dodged, dodged the bullet. And with the consequences of the war in Ukraine and the monetary tightening that is now taking place across the advanced economies, the environment is looking uh, particularly hostile in terms of its potential impact uh, on, on the debt situation in developing countries. I mean, if you take an, I take an example, which you know, is not necessarily on the, uh, as prominent on the, on the radar screen as, as some countries, but if you take a country like Ghana, um, which since 2011 has seen its external debt rise from 12 to something like 34% of GDP, uh, projected external debt payments of 2.2 billion, and nearly 20% of government uh, revenues um, go into servicing uh, Ghana's debt. At least this year, it's, it's around 20%. Uh, and, and, that, and, and, and that situation is now worsening as a consequence of the war. Um, if you take LICS as, an, a, a, the, the, as a group, then already average bond price yields have risen by 63 basis points since the start of the war. I mean, the, 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 the noose is really tightening around, around uh, many developing countries. Uh, and and I, I took Ghana because I think the, the, the finance minister of Ghana, Ken Aforia, after, in a recent interview with the Financial Times, you know, was very explicit both about what he saw as the inadequate response of the multilateral system to the uh, difficult position that a country like his uh, had found itself as a consequence of the of the COVID shock and 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 the lack of real um, initiatives to kind of come up with a, 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 a alternatives to what the, the, the debt service suspension initiative being really the only one that was offered and, and he, 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 he describes it as wholly inadequate. And he said there in the end of the interview that he gave back in February in the FT that what he said is that we need, and I quote, we need to seriously evaluate whether the rules laid down at the end of the Second World War are the most appropriate going forward. And, and clearly they're not. And we need to have a different kind of discussion from, from the discussions around uh, transparency and good governance and the way in which a lot is of, that, of the discussion about handling debt problems is still framed. And I, and I, and I think, you know, in that context, the principles, as, as, as I'm sure Euphen and others will explain in greater detail, you know, was an important initiative coming out of the global financial crisis. It is, as Penelope said, a soft law uh, uh, principles. It's, it's, not a, it's not the end of the story, but I think it's a very important step towards thinking about the reforming the architecture in a, in a systemic way. Uh, and it's very important, I think, and I think it is an opportune moment to, to try and rebuild traction uh, around the principles. Uh, it, it, I think it's, it, it is pro probably, uh, rel or at least relatively easier than, than doing that around some of our other initiatives, obviously, uh, particularly around the issue of sovereign debt restructuring mechanism, where we can, I think, find support from uh, not only uh, heavily indebted countries, but also um, credit countries and certainly in the advanced world. The project itself, as you all probably know, was sponsored by Norway.
um, at that time, and and they were very they were very strong backers of the project. They they've tended to drift away into other issues more recently. But I think I think it really is that moment we need to push hard, see if there's any changes that we might want to make to the principles. But fundamentally, just to kind of re try and build a kind of alliance that can promote these in the in in the necessary circles as as one of the uh, ways of, of, of balancing the system in a way that, 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 that gives developing countries the kinds of fiscal space they need to tackle these multiple crises, this cascade of crises as Penelope described them, um, that are now uh, hitting developing countries on a, on a regular basis. So I think I do look forward, I mean, unfortunately I can't stay with you, but I do think this is an important discussion and I, and I hope we can make, make progress in the, in the coming months around this, around this issue. So thanks, Penelope. Thank you so much, Richard. And thank you for uh, setting out that, not only the historical uh, uh, process around it, but also, of course, the importance of this moment. Um, so allow me now to turn to um, our representative from MEFMI, um, Mr. Stanley Lassenkata. Welcome, Stan, from uh, Zimbabwe. It's lovely to have you here. Um, over to you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Penelope. I'll give these remarks on behalf of uh, Dr. Louis Kasekende, um, our executive director. Unfortunately, he's not uh, been able to join us um, uh, this afternoon uh, due to the change uh, in the scheduling of the uh, webinar. Uh, he's already in another activity and um, it was thought that he might join us um, at 2.30 uh, Harare time, but this is now not uh, possible. So, uh, Mr. Richard Kozo Wright, uh, distinguished uh, panelists, participants, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to word, uh, cordially welcome you all to this uh, joint um, ANCTAD and MEFMI webinar uh, on our principles of uh, responsible, uh, principles of promoting responsible lending and uh, borrowing. Uh, at the outset, I would like to express our gratitude uh, to ANCTAD for partnering with uh, MEFMI in organizing this webinar. Uh, which, uh, like um, uh, Richard, Richard has mentioned, is uh, both uh, timely and uh, relevant. Um, it's timely, I mean, we all know the environment um, within which uh, we've been uh, over the past um, uh, two years, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, and um, which, as we all know, has been um, a quite devastating loss of human lives, um, affecting uh, public service uh, delivery in health, uh, education, and uh, as well as uh, social uh, protection. Uh, businesses have uh, scaled down or closed altogether. And uh, this has led to economic contractions uh, in many of our countries. And for countries in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, the pandemic uh, presents uh, the policymakers with uh, very practical uh, challenges that are not easy. Uh, to deal with. And uh, some of these challenges, and uh, let me um, mention at this stage, are how to address the short-term and medium-term spending needs uh, in response to the, the pandemic, uh, while at the same time uh, meeting the long-term uh, development objectives. Uh, number two, how to mobilize additional resources in the context of um, the narrow uh, revenue basis in these countries. And thirdly, how to contain the uh, rising public debt burden, which are uh, like um, uh, Richard has mentioned, um, it was already high uh, at the start of the pandemic in uh, 2019. So given the interlink linkages uh, of these are the uh, three issues that I've mentioned, uh, it's a challenge for policymakers uh, to achieve these policy goals at the same time uh, without leading to worse off outcomes um, on any of them. And uh, for example, uh, the quest to uh, increase spending, uh, um, in, in a quest to, to, to increase uh, spending in response to uh, the pandemic has led to an increase in um, uh, public debt um, significantly, as well as the associated uh, vulnerabilities. And the IMF estimates that uh, public debt in the region uh, increased uh, from 50% uh, of GDP in uh, 2019 to 57% uh, in 
by 2020, which is a significant jump just in uh, one year. And as we all know, uh, many of our countries are now at um, a high risk of uh, dead distress or are already in dead distress. And I was looking at the numbers uh, in the IMF um, and World Bank reports that they indicate that um, for most of the PRGT eligible countries, uh, they have been reclassified uh, from, uh, from a low risk uh, to um, moderate risk. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this situation as well as outlook is uh, actually quite worrying. And there's need for all of us to join hands to address the challenges that um, lie ahead of us. Because if these are not addressed um, effectively, uh, the rising public debt uh, burdens will continue to crowd out investments in development and other social inclusion uh, programs. And this would entail, or this would derail the attainment of the uh, international um, sustainable de development goals. And therefore, there is need for both lenders as well as um, uh, borrowers uh, to take part in dealing with these uh, developmental challenges. And this is where this webinar uh, provides us with an excellent opportunity uh, to have an open dialogue on the experiences and challenges on public debt management, and especially on the application of the uh, principles uh, in, our, in our respective uh, countries. So at um, this stage, I would like to uh, urge all of you uh, to participate fully in this webinar and make the most out of it, because um, this webinar provides us an opportunity to share experiences and also to learn uh, from one another um, in uh, public uh, debt management. And with those remarks, I'd like to wish you uh, all the best in uh, this webinar. Thank you so much. And uh, I hand over to Penelope. Thank you. Thank you, Stan. Very helpful comments and a very useful uh, context setting for us. Appreciate that. I now have the privilege of welcoming Ms. Yufin Lee, who is a former UN dependent, independent expert on foreign debt and human rights. She currently works at the South South Center here in Geneva. But very importantly, she was part of the same branch at UNCTAD, where I currently work, um, and was the leader of all the work that went into the, the promotion of these principles, the establishment of them, um, the huge amount of work that went into commissioning economic and legal opinion into developing this, the consensus building. And so it is a real privilege to welcome the mother um, of the principles here. Welcome, Yufin. Over to you. Well, uh, thank you so much, Penelope, for the very nice, very kind words uh, to introduce me. Um, I, I hope I can live up to that. Uh, thank you for the invitation uh, just now, uh, Richard, and also the representative of NAFMI, uh, as well as uh, Penelope. I have set the stage for this webinar very well. Uh, I quite agree with Richard that this is an opportune moment to revisit and also rebuild the attraction of the UNCTAD principles. Uh, we, we need to really seriously assess uh, the strong points, the strength of the principles. Uh, allow me to use the, the assigned time uh, to first talk about uh, uh, why we need a set of principles, which the previous speakers mentioned. Uh, uh, and uh, secondly, uh, the reasons for revitalizing the UNCTAD principles. And finally, uh, how to implement and revitalize the principles in the national and uh, international context. Uh, currently, as mentioned just now, we are facing many challenges. Uh, we know there, there have been headwinds to global economic growth, worsening debt vulnerabilities mentioned by Richard with specific numbers, uh, the ongoing pandemic, infl inflation, commodity price hikes, ge geopolitical tension, the list can really get much longer. Uh, amid all these problems, the concern of a new debt crisis is getting more worrisome. Debt crisis always makes people think about what could have done better to avoid or mitigate the crisis. 
uh, naturally, uh, we are also thinking about how to recover from the pandemic that are greener and, and fairer. Uh, to borrow or to lend money, as we know, is not a thing. Actually, raising debt can be a way to uh, get needed financing to boost economic growth, increase investment, uh, and also roll over old debt. However, not to borrow or lend responsibly uh, could land borrowers in debt crisis, could make lenders lose the expected returns from lending. However, aside from some sectoral codes of conduct and uh, the limited mandates and rules of the IMF and the multilateral development banks, sovereign financing is an area that has historically been located outside the radar of international law. Uh, this, is, this is indeed one of the most underdeveloped areas of international law. Uh, this legal void makes it difficult to formulate acceptable moral and technical judgments of irresponsible behavior as there are no clear boundaries of behavior uh, as well as expectations for uh, behavior for creditors and borrowers. Uh, coupled with deregulation of the financial sector in the past decades, uh, there, there is insufficient deterrence to reckless lending and borrowing. As there is no international consensus on rules and laws uh, to guide foreign financing, both and lenders and borrowers have approached the issues in the way they deem appropriate or serve their objectives, which ultimately may not be responsible or optimal, and sometimes uh, to the extent of creating uh, and increasing debt vulnerability uh, and uh, also financial instability. We've seen many instances of serious lack of good judgment or lack of a responsible behavior with global implications. History shows uh, that undisciplined, ineffective, abusive, or non-cooperative behavior on the part of both creditors and uh, sovereign debtors can sow seeds of debt crisis and even lead to crisis finally. More specifically, there, there has been borrowing for the purpose of kicking the can down the road, even over borrowing uh, and lending without proper scrutiny of credit and market risks. And also for the purpose in many instances of getting uh, quick returns, sometimes very quick returns. Uh, meanwhile, we know the debt market has become more complex and more risky over the past decades. Uh, with the development of technology, debt, debt change hands more quickly. Just a few seconds on the computer keyboards, uh, you can make a transaction. There have also been uh, more debt instruments and more actors in the debt market. The change in composition of debt from mainly syndicated bank loans uh, to bonds and other instruments uh, has made the capital market more volatile. Uh, with a globalization and a more interdependent world uh, and computerization of financial operations, debt, debt crises hit the world harder as we have seen from the past crisis and contagion spreads much faster than before. Uh, debt crises are increasingly becoming more costly and more damaging for countries and people, uh, leading to major reversals of hard-won economic gains. Therefore, to promote responsible code of conduct on the part of sovereign borrowers and lenders to sovereigns uh, would be considered as a public good, a contribution to debt crisis prevention and resolution uh, naturally to uh, global financial stability. Now, let me just uh, mention briefly why we would like to revitalize the UNCTAD principles. Uh, UNCTAD, as mentioned just now by Richard and uh, Penelope, 
uh, that start, uh, UNCTAD started to work on the principles in 2008 when the global financial crisis was still evolving. Uh, the crisis generated a widespread concern about the lack of international rules and regulations over the financial sector, as I mentioned just now, uh, as the global financial system was and still is, Richard mentioned just now about that, uh, still is the post-World War II power structure still governs uh, to maintain status quo uh, has its attraction to major market players. Therefore, the introduction of hard law to overcome systemic problems would be difficult and time consuming. Uh, with the financial support of Norway, UNCTA started to work on the soft law approach uh, to formulate the principles on responsible sovereign lending and borrowing. Before UNCTA principles, two sets of principles got some attention at that time. Uh, one was the principles for stable uh, capital flows and, and fair debt restructuring in emerging markets drafted in 2004 by the Institute of International Finance. The IAF principles were meant to apply only to the private sector creditors and emerging market sovereign debtors. So from what I know, uh, no developed uh, or developing countries subsequently committed to abide by these principles. The principles were also viewed as lack of balance in terms of uh, distribution of responsibilities between lenders and borrowers, or they are generally meant to regulate borrowers' behaviors, uh, especially the emerging market the borrowers. More concretely, uh, there is broad duty for borrowers to disclose uh, relevant information, but there is no correlative uh, due diligence duty on the part of lenders. Another set of principles was developed by the OECD in 2008 uh, called the principles and guidelines uh, to promote sustainable lending in the, in the provision of official export credits to low-income countries. So as the name suggests, the principles only relates to export credit agencies and only their loans to low-income countries. Thus, with the principles uh, has a very narrow coverage limiting to one category of countries and to one type of debt instruments. Comparing with these principles, the UNCTAD principles are much more holistic and comprehensive covering all debt instruments used by sovereigns and all categories of countries. Uh, UNCTAD uh, is also very well positioned to do so. Uh, unlike OECD or IAF, uh, UNCTAD uh, being the, uh, the, the, the Department uh, of the United Nations enjoys the universality and also the equal basis of its membership. UNCTAD is also the focal point for uh, debt issues in the United uh, Nations system. Uh, UNCTAD has the mandate and acknowledged expertise on debt issues. Together with the fact that UNCTAD is not a financial actor in the global markets, UNCTAD was and still is in a unique position, institutional position actually, to promote a set of principles to introduce financial behavior changes. Uh, UNCTAD's ambition was reflected in how the principles was formulated. The process of formulation was inclusive, transparent, scholarly, solid, authoritative, and elaborate. I use these words for good reasons. Huh? I dare say none of other principles has gone to such length as the UNCTAD principles. None has got the national and international endorsement uh, as the uh, government uh, 
Uh, I fear that we may just have lost uh, you from there. Um, I suspect that perhaps it was just a, her trying to um, stop the cell phone. So uh, perhaps we could just give her one minute to rejoin. Um, if you just bear with us for a second. Um, I think the, the very key point that she raises was the universality um, of the work that was done on the principles. And I think um, the depth that in, in which it's uh, been undertaken, and of course its acceptance, um, both internationally and domestically and nationally in certain cases, um, really does mean that there is something here uh, that many participants see as valid. I think the, the key issue that does come out of the principles in terms of how we look at them at UNCTAD is that there is a very key underlying principle that there should be a balance between responsibility and risk uh, in terms of the undertaking um, of debt. And very often we know that uh, creditors to sovereigns um, often flood in when they see quick returns to be made, but then um, even if in fact, in retrospect, one could examine the, the, the credit that's been offered as reckless, um, they still want full return um, on their engagement with that country. And so I think this is really about saying, if we're all going to be responsible, then in fact, we also need to share the risks that are associated with what is ultimately um, a, an enterprise that is not without risk, um, even although it's, of course, uh, granted to a sovereign. I cannot see um, Yufen rejoining us. So perhaps we, it would be best for us to move on to Thea. Thea, um, it's delightful to have you here. Uh, Thea is uh, a representative of Debt Justice in Norway. They have recently undertaken um, a very large project examining the use of principles, not only on TADS, but others uh, within the private sector, um, and in particular within certain institutions within the Norway um, institutional base. So we're looking forward to hearing from you, Thea. Welcome. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Is everything working with the techniques? Yes, great. And uh, just uh, give me a heads up if uh, you can jumps back in and wants to um, make her final points. Yes, so um, as Penelope was saying, um, I'm working with uh, Dutch Justice Norway. I'm a policy advisor and um, uh, I can sort of uh, bring uh, a national context uh, case to you on this uh, about uh, implementation of responsible lending and borrowing practices. Uh, as has been mentioned already, Norway was quite instrumental in developing uh, these UNCTAD principles back in the days. And there's sort of like a tradition of, um, of uh, responsible lending and borrowing being sort of like a, a quite a prominent uh, um, priority of the Norwegian government. Um, uh, I, I can just start by sort of framing, framing this within the, the uh, our work the last couple of years. We have recently uh, issued a report that is sort of like a part one of a two-part project where we're looking to, to um, make recommendations on best practices for responsible lending and borrowing on the part of private investors. Um, and then in this project, we have sort of analyzed all the existing frameworks um, that are aimed at responsible lending and borrowing practices either aimed at uh, bilateral lenders and borrowers or towards private creditors, um, multilateral institution, etc. Uh, so uh, for anyone interested, I can sort of uh, link to this report and you can see in the appendix the, analy and the analysis. So uh, there we have analyzed the G uh, G20 operational guidelines, the UNCTAD principles, the OECD principles, the UNPRI, um, the IMF the sustainability framework, different frameworks of um, different um, private investors in Norway, and um, to sort of see what's the overlapping consensus between these 
uh, principles that are out there because one of the difficulties have been establishing a global consensus on responsible lending and borrowing practices that sort of and um, different groups of countries and creditors can sort of all get behind so that's so uh, well one of the aims of the project is sort of trying to to identify this overlapping consensus um but uh, just to uh, give you a, a sort of a case of this uh, as you're probably aware and norway has this thing called like a um, um, national sovereign wealth fund the norwegian government sovereign wealth fund it's called and um it's a it's a big sort of investment fund sort of opera um operating as a private investor but it's government owned so it's sort of like a hybrid investor in that sense and um, um, it's quite a, a large uh, investment fund um, uh, the Norwegian sovereign wealth fund owns roughly one percent of all stocks globally so just to give you sort of like a idea of the scope of the fund and um, the Norwegian government pension fund has adopted or is ref referencing the UNCTAD principles in their own due diligence system. And um, the fund also has quite a detailed operationalizing of different sort of um, responsible lending and borrowing practices that are built on, uh, among others, the UNCTAD principles, but also other international standards relating to responsibility. And um, I think sort of one thing that is interesting about this is that the Sovereign Wealth Fund is now sort of not exposed to a lot of countries that will or are already experiencing that distress. So uh, sort of these um, systems were adopted, um, I think uh, maybe four years ago, the current principles were adopted and already now four years later when there is uh, widespread the debt and uh, sustainability issues um, in the market you can already see that sort of the the principles are working in the sense that the fund is not exposed to those countries that are experiencing that distress so that sort of illustrates that having concrete standards to a secure responsibility also leads to not being exposed to these um, issues um, but so I just to give you some of the sort of like the strength strengths of this um, specific implementation um, is that um, because the sovereign wealth fund is a, a nationally owned investment fund uh, it's um, governed by the Norwegian parliament uh, so the financial committee oh you and you're back um, should I just pause and let you Yufen finish before I um, go further? Um, I think if you don't mind, because I understand yeah. that Yufen does have some time constraints. Is that right, Yufen? Are uh, you currently muted, Yufen? We can't hear you. Uh, let me just see if I can just unmute you. Um, Ah, yeah, I'm but, really sorry because I have to join another meeting. They called me. Let me just finish this. And then, yeah, I'm really sorry about the technical problem. Let, let me just continue very quickly. Huh? So we were talking about uh, the uh, the UNCTAD principles, uh, how the uh, how UNCTAD uh, is really well, very well positioned to introduce such kind of set of uh, uh, principles. And the UNCTAD uh, processes has been very elaborate. Uh, and uh, at the very beginning, uh, in order to be inclusive and authoritative, uh, UNCTAD established an expert group in order to have open, transparent, and inclusive dialogue among all stakeholders. Uh, the expert group composed a prominent world-renowned specialist in law, finance, and economics. Uh, the expert group was really like a who's who uh, in the sovereign debt world. Uh, senior representatives of non-governmental organizations uh, were part of it. Uh, the private sector and the representative of IIF, 
about electoral financial institutions, including the IMF, World Bank, and Paris Club Secretariat, were observers and they participate at really high level. Uh, MEFMI was a member of the expert group. Uh, after more than a year's in-depth uh, exchange of views, UNCTAD had the second draft of the principles. Uh, each principle had um, an analytical piece by famous scholars. Eventually, the Oxford University Press put uh, all these uh, papers together and published a book. Uh, extensive dialogues were conducted and validation was undertaken in earnest and at ministerial level. Uh, uh, during 2011 and uh, 2012, five regional consultative meetings uh, with national officials at ministerial level uh, took place in Buenos Aires, Bangkok, Geneva, Giada, and uh, Punta Gana uh, in order to get uh, government uh, feedback on the design and the possible implementation process. Uh, around uh, 75 or 76 countries provided their views on the draft principles. Uh, and then after a series of bilateral and high level regional governmental uh, consultations, uh, the expert group introduced uh, further refinements uh, to the draft principles in line with the feedback obtained from these dialogues and uh, uh, regional meetings. The consolidated version of the principles was launched on the occasion of UNCTAD 13 uh, ministerial conference in Doha, and then also started the project's phase of endorsement and implementation. Uh, the inclusive and transparent process of drafting and endorsing the principles itself actually is a source of legitimacy for the UNCTAD principles. Uh, another unique feature of the UNCTAD principles is that none of the existing principles have had the national and international endorsement uh, like the UNCTAD principles uh, have done. 13 developed and developed countries have uh, endorsed uh, the UNCTAD principles uh, since uh, their release for endorsement in uh, uh, 2012. Uh, this include uh, Germany, Norway, uh, Brazil, Argentina, Italy, Nepal, Morocco, uh, Cameroon, uh, Colombia, Gabon, Honduras, Mauritania, and Paraguay. Uh, the annual United Nations General Assembly resolution on external debt for many years uh, stressed the importance of re responsible sovereign lending and borrowing uh, em emphasizing that creditors and debtors must share responsibilities for preventing unsustainable debt situation. Uh, and uh, uh, the uh, uh, Finance for Development Conference in uh, 2015 also emphasized this, and the UNCTAD uh, Debt Management Conferences, uh, the sixth, seven, eighth, and I can't remember the, the rest, also discuss the principles respectively. Now let, let, let us very briefly review the strength of UNCAD principles. It, it, the strength lies in its comprehensive and holistic treatment of all debt instruments and all actors in the process, both lenders and borrowers. Uh, the emphasis of co-responsibility of lenders and borrowers were actually uh, uh, emphasized for the first time. And it really corrected the misconception that borrowers are the only party to be blamed. That used to be like that. Uh, uh, out of the set of 15 principles, seven principles are for lenders and eight principles are for uh, the borrowers. The normative contribution of these principles uh, lies not in the creation of new rights nor in, uh, obligations uh, in international law, but in identifying, harmonizing, and uh, systematizing uh, the basic principles and best practices applied to sovereign lending and borrowing, and in elaborating uh, 
the implications of these standards and practices for lenders and borrowers at the international level. Uh, the, the principles do not aim to directly change domestic or international law, but strive to durably change the behavior of lenders uh, to sovereigns and sovereign borrowers, uh, with uh, resulting uh, a kind of uh, shift in sovereign borrowing and lending practices. Uh, UNCTAD principles are a robust and well-grounded soft law type of principles. Uh, the, the principles comprise such important legal concepts as fiduciary duty, accountability, transparency, due diligence, co-responsibility, debt monitoring, good faith, etc. cetera. Uh, they can be found in most of the domestic legal orders, but are missing at the international level. Uh, this means that the principles are rooted in well-grounded and already successfully tested rules and, uh, and uh, cases at the domestic level. So the principles are meant to bring major benefits to both uh, sovereign borrowers and lenders. Let me finally come to how to implement and revitalize the principles at the national and international levels. I won't go to details, but just to specify uh, in, in what way we can uh, uh, revitalize the principles. First of all, we know that to facilitate the implementation of the principles, UNCTAD published the guidelines for the principles in 2013. These guidelines are designed to increase the understanding and ultimately adherence to the UNCTAD principles. Uh, at the national level, uh, both the general codes and specific legislation could be major vehicles for implementing the principles. Uh, over the past years, we already know that, uh, uh, that uh, to introduce international hard law uh, or international treaty uh, would be very difficult uh, and very time consuming. So countries are have been trying to find alternative through enacting national le legislation uh, for areas that has been a way to introduce changes. For instance, for instance, uh, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit late. Uh, Belgium and UK have introduced their laws. And, uh, and I think uh, UNCTAD principles can follow this approach. Uh, countries can adjust uh, their, their own legal and regulatory orders to incorporate UNCTAD principles into their normative uh, universe. Uh, and they can also introduce guidelines and other frameworks. Let me stop this. Uh, and, um, also, uh, the UNCTAD principles can be incorporated into capacity building programs on debt management, uh, which uh, DEMFAS has done, and it can also be incorporated in World Bank's debt management performance assessment. So debt management agencies can explore the possibility of uh, incorporating the UNCTAD principles in their operational practice. Uh, domestic and international courts could also benefit from UNCTAD principles by using the principles to interpret uh, hard law instruments uh, in ways that encourage parties involved in sovereign debt uh, contracting to adopt more responsible behavior. Uh, arbitral uh, tribunals can also take advantage of UNCTAD principles uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, the, of course, uh, countries can design uh, uh, the, the kind of overs oversight and pu public po policies on sovereign lending and borrowing at both international and national levels. Uh, th there are many ways to implement and revitalize the UNCTAD principles, which we can, we can discuss in, in details later not to revitalize uh, UNCTAD principles, I think would be a huge waste of international efforts, 
financial and human resources used to develop and endorse the principles. There, there have already been strong national and international support to the principles to revitalize and implement them would benefit the world and contribute to the debt crisis uh, prevention and resolution and also to the reform of the international debt architecture. Uh, let me stop here. I'm so sorry about the technical problem. And I will leave for, for a little bit of time and come back to the meeting when it comes to discussion. Sorry, my apologies. Thank Not you. Not at all, Yufen, thank you so much for that very sweeping and in-depth understanding that you bring uh, on the principles to all of us. Thank you very much. Thea, so, yeah, I'm going to turn back to you. Um, yes. um, we left off where you were talking about um, how, in fact, you thought the application of the principles had really been useful uh, yes. for the National Sovereign Wealth Fund. Yeah. Um, yeah. So just to sort of jump uh, right back in where I left off, um, as Yufin was mentioning, uh, sort of for the UNCTAD principles to be uh, operational, you have to implement them nationally basically and and this uh, sovereign wealth fund is like one example of how to implement um these principles or uh, responsible lending and borrowing practices in a national context so one thing that i think is interesting about <clears throat> how these principles for responsible lending and borrowing have been implemented in the norwegian sovereign wealth fund is a sort of the example of how to take uh, something like soft law principles in the onctad principles and, and um, sort of transform it into more hard law principles because um, the sovereign wealth fund um, is governed by, as I mentioned, the parliament. So um, the financial committee of the Norwegian parliament are the ones who sort of set the principle boundaries for the investments. And they have a very sort of like a clear ethical investment mandate from the parliament. And um, uh, if the fund sort of doesn't uh, adhere to these principles, um, it's it's in fact uh, illegal. You know, it's um, it's uh, it's uh, yeah, it's a hard law principle sort of uh, governing of uh, the fund. So that's uh, one thing that makes it useful is that it's uh, it's sanctionable if it's not complied with. And then um, in 2018, the Sovereign Wealth Fund adopted some principles aimed at uh, sort of um, securing responsible lending and borrowing to other states uh, through investments in government bonds. And um, I think one of the things that is use useful about this example is that, as you have mentioned, these IIF principles back in the days were sort of uh, um, developed by private investors but aimed at regulating borrowing countries uh, conduct instead um, the principles of the sovereign wealth fund is aimed at securing responsible lending practices by the investor um, so it's sort of uh, it's more aimed at securing due diligence on the part of um, the sovereign wealth fund uh, all of the transparency requirements are um, attached to the sovereign wealth fund's own uh, internal due diligence systems and reporting on the adherence with those systems. Um, so that makes it useful. It's uh, it's more sort of um, um, it's easier to uh, sort of um, have uh, autonomy over your own conduct than uh, sort of trying to influence the other party. Um, which also means that uh, since this is also sort of like a hard law principle set, um, it's uh, obligatory for the fund to follow these principles. And that leads to the fund not being exposed to these markets that are experiencing um, debt distress currently. That's also, of course, uh, one of the problems because um, sort of um, um, strict um strict due diligence systems or strict principles on responsibility in lending can in some instances lead to um uh, lack of funding for countries who actually need um to access these um, funding opportunities so that's sort of um the negative flip side of the coin 
but um, on the other hand, uh, it does mean that you will not lend into situations that are already unsustainable and it will also deter this kind of opportunistic behavior that Penelope and UFN have already mentioned where uh, some investment funds um, sort of lend into already unsustainable debt situations in the hopes of uh, securing a fast or a high return um, often through, through this litigious and abusive um, um, conduct that we often see from these so-called vulture funds. So uh, yeah, that's uh, <laughs> one case of how to sort of implement these principles on a national level. Uh, and also um, I linked to this report in the, um, uh, in the chat there if you want to see more details on where these different international frameworks overlap and where they, they differ, you can read in the appendix. And also a lot of the um, suggestions uh, and best practices for private lenders is of course, of course also <laughs> relevant for other sovereign debt actors, uh, bilateral lenders and borrowers, etc. cetera. Um, and um, yeah, um, Penelope, I see that the time is, is running. Uh, uh, should I say something more or should we just uh, save it for discussion part later? And, uh, and proceed to the next. Uh, yeah, thank you analysis. so much. I think it would be great if we could now just hand over uh, to Mr. Jacob Makandwiri uh, of the Bank of Zambia. Um, he's a former director of investment and debt management um, at the Ministry of Finance in Zambia. Um, so we're very honored to have you here. Uh, the floor is yours. Um, hello and uh... Thank you very much, uh, Ajad and uh, Mefmi, for, for this opportunity to share uh, on this uh, very topical subject that I think is timely. Um, I think in the interest of time, let me just go into, I think, what I, I think I could speak to in terms of some of the experiences in the countries in the region. I think uh, the background and indeed the objective of what the principles uh, are meant to achieve has been well articulated there. Um, we, we, what they, they want to achieve, I think countries generally have agreed to what the uh, principles um, are intended to achieve. So a number of our countries, I think over the years since the principles came uh, into being have been proactively uh, subscribing to what the um, is of adopting some of the, um, the the recommendations, if I may put that way, that the principles uh, put across. I think most of the countries in the sub-region have updated their legal frameworks, and you see that have been um, aligning them what the principles uh, propose. I think there's clarity in terms of the structures uh, for contraction of the debt. I think the legal mandates have been uh, clarified and a number of the principles uh, uh, come through in terms of the, the primary as well as the secondary legislation that is governing the debt uh, management processes. I think we have seen um, increasingly very few um, responsible borrowing. Uh, most of the countries I think have largely been streamlining uh, establishing uh, public debt management offices that is aligned to really best principle in terms of aligning to front, uh, middle and back offices. So largely, I think uh, the principles have did, I think, uh, fundamentally uh, contributed to improvement uh, across uh, the region in terms of uh, improvements in debt management. Uh, uh, obviously, the landscape has changed from, I think, the time that um, the principles were articulated and that what uh, they were uh, resolving in terms of what were the issues that the borrower needed to take into consideration as well as the lenders. I think um, principally, it's very clear that um, um, the, 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 the debt in, uh, in itself is intrinsically political and you find that the principles has really addressed most of the uh, uh, structural processes uh, underlying debt management per se, but I think as was indicated in the challenges of implementing uh, 
that there is no international law and so on, I think is one of the challenges that we don't see explicit um, adoption and use of the principles in the uh, debt management uh, frameworks at the national level. I think that uh, gap in the international forum to be a benchmark for implementing the principles, I think attributes to some of the gaps we still see. I think the challenges that have been expressed with regards to the debt situation in the countries exacerbated by, of course, the uh, COVID and now this uh, conflict, uh, Ukraine, Russia, I think shows that indeed this is a timely conversation in terms of us revisiting these principles and I think critically updating them, taking into account the latest developments. I think most of the countries um, now, for example, in the region have gone to capital markets, but you see that in the principles, largely the assumption perhaps is more of loan instruments and so on. So how do we deal with those uh, class, uh, uh, you know, creditors, the complications there, and indeed, as has been already explained, we don't have that international framework for those resolutions, I think is a critical point to take going forward. I think uh, largely now we see that some of the debt challenges that are being faced are not largely to do with uh, uh, lack of adherence to principles uh, uh, by the borrowers and also maybe by the lenders, uh, but largely to do with the environment. I think the global economic situation has precipitated some of the crises, and so we need to start uh, looking at uh, those perspectives as well as we review the principles going forward. Um, further also, the, the, the debt crisis and debt challenges being faced to resolution remains critically an issue that needs to come to the fore in the principles. Uh, we need some specifics in terms of what can be done to enhance uh, quick resolutions of the debt challenges. Because in the short to medium term, that's the area we are seeing a lot of uh, developing countries facing serious challenges that may um, uh, disturb the return maybe to the pre-COVID uh, growth situation and so on. So the principles remain key in most of the countries as I've mentioned that they still remain a key and good reference in terms of the best, um, uh, uh, the, the, the best way to manage processes as well as uh, update uh, uh, documents, legal, and so on. But obviously, the points that have been raised that this is an opportune time to revisit cannot come at a better time, especially that we are seeing all these uh, debt problems in, uh, in, in developing countries. So it suffices to say that uh, some of the key areas that perhaps we will need to look at as we uh, revitalize the principles is really to to have concurrence in terms of the assumptions of the lenders and creditors. I think they're diverse. There are new creditors that have come on board, the non-traditional ones, and who have totally no idea what these principles are all about. And so we need to have a platform to share these principles and to have buy-in. And I was happy to hear that ANCTA indeed does sit uh, institutionally, critically at a very uh, good vantage point from where they can uh, uh, push this agenda that there's by neither signing off, it may not be a law, but indeed an adoption that uh, any um, instruments that are executed between parties, they have to sign off that they have, uh, uh, they have been uh, 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 referred to the principles and that both the lender and the uh, borrower subscribe to the principles as a governance structure in terms of their relationship, I think would be a good uh, tick box going forward so that the principles in terms of resolution also start uh, getting aligned to what I think would be espoused in the revitalized uh, principles. So they have saved us uh, in the period that they have been in place, but I think there are clearly gaps, hence the challenges that uh, we, 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 we have seen. And there's need now to reflect very, very clearly and be specific. I think in uh, some respects, the principles have been quite general, but it's time to put the experiences uh, into context and be more specific in terms of what the principles uh, uh, are trying to, to resolve uh, to, to, to both the borrowers and the lenders.
So indeed, uh, from the background of uh, trying to work on the institutional arrangements, as well as in terms of the processes uh, that the borrowers would do, I think there's more some maturity in that area. I think we now to move, we need to move now to some practical issues in terms of how these things should sit as part of our uh, governance in debt management. So I look forward to that sort of uh, work. Uh, obviously, the, the, the debt managers in the debt offices would provide very useful um, um, experiences in this regard, because I think the dynamics have changed quite a bit. I was fortunate I was still in the debt area in the, when these principles were being done, and we were working on these principles really in the post uh, hippie uh, uh, time, and then there was the international global uh, crisis. So there was a lot of uh, uh, eyes on the, the structures of debt management offices, the conduct, capacity, and so on. But I think where the world is now, those are some of the things that uh, uh, institutions like MEFMI have helped to resolve. I think there's uh, some sufficient capacity in the debt offices in the region. But again, uh, the debt management, debt instrument, there's been an evolution there. As I've said, some of our countries have now gone to capital markets. That's the new area. So again, resolutions there are complicated. As you mentioned, some of our countries are now in default mode. So the challenge is real and um, the solutions are unfortunately not uh, close by. So even the principles right now are not assisting much in that regard, but, but we see that increasingly with what is going on on the commodity prices in the market uh, as something that uh, many of our countries will start facing very soon. And uh, we need to start having some traction. Obviously, the, uh, the, the suspensions have helped, but as has been already alluded to, they've been inadequate. So what is the next step? Um, this is, I think, the question that, uh, as uh, Stanley posed, we are all facing uh, in the debt management offices in the region that we may sooner or later have to ponder this question and have some solutions. So with UNCTAD uh, having this, uh, uh, sit at the top uh, in a vantage institution. We hope there will be leadership from that perspective and that end that they push this matter onto the necessary platform to make it be an agenda, especially in other fora as well where there's discussion about debt resolutions. I think resolving the debt is one, but what happens going forward? I think that's where the principles uh, come in handy that beyond the resolution of the debt, there'll be these principles that will guide at least uh, 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 to mitigate any re, um, uh, revision to other debt crisis. I think it has worked very well since I think the, the hippie process, this is the time when again over 10 years, we are seeing some uh, new challenges that largely are not from really internal in the debt management processes or the policy frameworks, but the environment is taking a toll. So how can the principles address that uh, perspective? So I think, let me leave it at that and maybe contribute uh, some more in the discussion. But from the regional perspective, I think this is what in summary I can say that we see increasingly adoption of the principles. In most instances, not very explicit, but you can read it through the legislation uh, in the primary legislation as well as in the secondary legislation, the guidelines are being uh, produced. There's transparency in the uh, debt management processes. So indeed, uh, there is the adoption, uh, although it may not be explicit, but it's comforting that it does come through when you pick the documents that are guiding the debt management. So from the uh, in-country uh, 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 experiences, basically, what you see, but it's difficult to see the same on the lender's side. Obviously, the idea for most of the countries has been to try as much as possible align the lenders to the internal policies and procedures, and hopefully, as they align to that, it espouses the principles uh, generally. So thank you very much, and uh, I'll be happy to come back if there are questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Mkwandewere. Uh, from our side, we really found your Input, input very, very helpful.
it's very useful to hear about how um, these principles have been useful, but perhaps, um, as you point out, there are two sets of things that is going on with the timing. New generations have come forth, both lenders and borrowers, who perhaps aren't aware of the principles. And of course, also the situation has become so dynamic, a change in the diversity of the creditors. Um, and also, of course, um, as we go into a period of time with heightened crises, um, the real need to resolve debt restructuring processes um, and also to critically assess the transformation of the international monetary system and what solutions it provides. May I just say, um, we are in a meeting, so everybody here has entitlement to ask questions. You may do so either in the chat or you may raise your hand. Um, we would like this very much to be a dynamic discussion. Um, if you do exit the, um, the session, please be aware we are um, surveying you with uh, for only four short questions. Um, if you'll bear with us, that is important for us um, as part of the project evaluation. So if you wouldn't mind just answering those questions as you exit. Um, I'm now opening the floor. Um, I think there were many issues that were raised. Um, from Thea, there was this issue of um, the possibility that once one translates the principles into red lines, um, that can actually lead to quite conservative behavior. Um, Mr. Nkanda Wiri made the point that um, the principles have a role to play in the debt offices and indeed have been inculcated in many of them. Um, but the question arises, does, is there the similar discipline, for example, in a parliamentary framework? Um, is there transparency um, also in the parliamentary side of things? Um, the question is also raised about the extent to which um, does the governance structure, is it adequate in an environment where so many of the crises that countries face are in fact um, come from external sources, um, whether we're talking about COVID or the implications of conflict on the price of wheat, um, these tend to be external factors that are affecting developing countries. So there are many issues here. Um, do we have any takers for questions? Well, the floor is open. Um, perhaps then I will um, I will address a question to Mr. Nkandawiri in the meanwhile. Um, this point that you raise about the, um, the, the, the need for, I suppose, almost a, a re-education of a new generation of lenders, or at least new lenders on the block, um, and also this question of the external factors associated with debt. Um, in your opinion, where do you think we could go with this as it relates to the principles? Would you feel that um, there is perhaps a role for us to extend the principles to um, also a kind of a parliamentary understanding of sovereign debt? Um, or do you see this as very much a question of trying to re-educate the lenders, the lender base. Thank you, Thank you very much for, for that great question. I think uh, uh, I, I'll respond maybe not specific with what uh, solutions there may be, but maybe just generally. So in terms of um, the, the education or maybe rolling out the, the revitalized principles, if I may say so, I think the, 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 the critical aspect of that is that we've now appreciated that uh, the creditors are not uniform. They're quite diverse, uh, both in terms of their practices and uh, their understanding of the international uh, financial architecture. It's been very uh, uh, diverse and they are not mainstream in terms of how they, um, uh, they, they lend and how uh, the, the transactions are executed. I think we, we, we have seen in a, a number of developing countries, some of the new lenders on the block have largely been uh, undertaking a lot of infrastructure uh, uh, projects, for instance, 
And uh, these are not uh, usually uh, direct funded projects, but are more, uh, 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 more or less like uh, export credits where they provide the, the, the institution to do their, the works from their own countries and they disperse there. So those have got further complications from the point of view of balance of payments, because there's no cash flows coming in, but there are liabilities being created. So you have got uh, huge uh, balance of payment recording challenges and so on. So the education is clear in terms of what uh, it means when such uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, facilities are being uh, uh, deployed to, to to borrowing countries, but obviously they are new, and that's the the, the good thing that when they are new, obviously they have to be introduced on how these things work. So hopefully, if there's a platform where this can be uh, shared strongly and um, critically, then we we see traction that, that there could be some some more or less standardization in terms of how lenders as a whole would behave in whatever particular instance. I think we've seen challenges right now. Even the common frameworks are not working very well because they are holdouts. There are some uh, creditors, some new creditors who are not playing ball. So again, you wonder, is it because they don't know how this uh, architecture works or how these things work? So one may think there is scope for uh, reintroducing this to such um, uh, new players in the in the in the in the market. So for me, I I think it's critical that uh, this information we need to put it back uh, into the uh, bigger picture for all the players to to appreciate. Another I uh, think perspective that I would think we need also to consider is when we consider the players in the uh, for example borrowing process. I think we've seen. Uh, critically, the role that, uh, for example, credit uh, uh, rating agencies play. So, in terms of the principles, what, what, how should they behave in this process? Because uh, we've seen that sometimes they have uh, downgraded, and uh, some, 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 some thoughts have been that they have worsened the situation, and so on. So, how do we bring them on board that uh, they also should, I think, subscribe to some? Uh, some principles around what they do, because critically, it has implications. So there I'm proposing, uh, 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 as we revitalize, we also uh, cast the net wide in terms of all the players that uh, have an implication in terms of what um, uh, the outcomes of our debt processes are going to be. So really from those two perspectives, I think it should help in terms of bringing on board the new players in that place and also casting the net wide to really relook really at um, generally who plays and participates. And just the last point here is that, um, as I mentioned, uh, debt management intrinsically is political by nature. So yes, uh, most of these principles, I think, have been thoroughly made available, discussed, but largely from the technical point of view. So I don't know exactly which platforms can address, I think, that level or that um, uh, sector of uh, uh, key players in the debt management process in terms of inculcating these principles, getting a buy-in from that political angle. Not necessarily that they implement, but they are aware as they seek to legislate, whether through parliament or as uh, heading a finance ministry. These are things they have heard, heard about or listened to, and they are also uh, being supportive of the adoption of these things uh, by the debt offices. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. I see we have a couple of questions. Uh, we have a question in the chat from uh, Igor. Uh, in what directions do the principles go from here? Should we push for them to be accepted as obligatory in the future? And if so, how could it be done? Alternatively, is there a market-based way to get private lenders on board? Um, there may be anybody in the audience who has a view. Thea, I'd like to turn that question to you, but I'm just going to give Stan and Likini a chance just to raise their questions as well. Please go ahead, Stan. Okay, uh, mine I think has been talked about uh, by uh, Jacob in terms of um, creating awareness at the political level. I think many of the uh, issues or challenges, okay, I mean, there's the environment which uh, Jacob has talked about, but also internally, I think there are issues uh, where um, the authorities uh, have got a, a role to play. 
So uh, re-educating the authorities at the country level, uh, because they are the ones who are in charge of um, uh, borrowing. So whether it's, we're talking about the governors or the PSAs or the ministers of um, uh, the ministers of finance, if at all, I mean, if we can also have uh, programs that target um, this uh, kind of uh, officials in terms of um, making them aware about the uh, these um, uh, anchored um, uh, principles, um, including the national assemblies. Uh, I think um, it, it would be great uh, for them to also be aware um, about this. And um, maybe more importantly, um, the technical officials themselves. Yes, I mean, we've uh, gone a long way uh, in terms of um, um, uh, building capacity to negotiate uh, for a new financing. Um, but I think we can also include aspects of the uh, anchored uh, principles. I think that would uh, uh, go a long way in terms of uh, building their capacity to negotiate uh, with um, uh, the, uh, the creditors. So these are the issues I wanted to, uh, to mention. Thank you. Many, many thanks very much. Uh, Hikini, we turn to you. Can you perhaps just tell us where you're from? Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much for the good presentations. I principally kind of agree with what my brother Gandawire was saying. Specifically at this point, or even during the financial crisis, live alone before the COVID and the current the war, we have seen that there is a great actual change from the lender side, moving away from the traditional, who may have kind of internalized the principles at the first part, to the commercial and the emerging emerging lenders. This is a big challenge because while the lending side has changed, the borrowing side has not really changed in the same direction, but, other, but rather moving in the opposite direction as they are also striving to attain the sustainable development goals with a lot of public commitments or public investment commitments. But again, what do we see? We see there is a great divergence from what they call LMA, Loan Management Association principles as, which is like much, uh, like much actually considered by the private lenders as compared to the principles of sovereign lending and borrowing. We can see that they are trying to overprotect the supply side, or they say the lender, lender side. And every clause in the agreement, they say this is according to LMA, simply protecting now the lenders at the expense of the needs, of the increasing needs of the borrowers. That really has been a challenge. But again, what we could see, especially during the hard times, for instance, during the COVID, we saw emergence of cheap money in one way or another, to the extent that most of the lenders, especially, I could see, they could say the rent seekers in one way or another, they are rushing to developing countries, knowing that these countries are experiencing fiscal, like dwindling or fiscal declines, and trying to actually give them money, which actually in most cases are tied with some hooks somewhere. So we see that during the crisis, one side of the equation, which is the lenders, they normally exploit it. They normally exploit it. And again, there is an issue like these debt treatments, that is the treatments. We had the DSSI, or we had even the HIPICS before, we had the MD, had the MDRIs, and now the common framework is coming. It is very likely to be abused, particularly by the borrowers, hoping that they will 
kind of free ride on it or the moral hazard may set in. But again, it is a challenge again because most of these like in commercial agreements have tried to protect the lenders. But if politicians or if borrowers are not well actually educated on this, they may think, okay, yes, let's go and borrow recklessly. I'm sorry to put it that way. Hoping that at one point or another, they will also join the common framework kind of so that they could also include even the private, the private lenders. But my, my worry now going forward, or given the current situation, where the oil prices are increasing. First of all, it is actually deteriorating the balance sheets of the non-oil producers. But again, it is strengthening the coffers of the exporters, oil exporters. This happened in during 1970s, where we found now cheap petrol dollars. Okay. It is very likely that I'm, the I'm huge sorry. profit. Hello. Okay. Sorry, yes. you know we're running out of time. I wonder if you could just okay, thank you. Thank shorten you. your statement. Yeah. I just like Thea to have the final word, if you don't mind. Have you finished? Thank you. Your okay. Statement? My, just okay, just to finish. My worry now is we will see cheap petrol dollars also looking for avenues to invest in the developing world. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the points you raised. Thea, please go go ahead. Yes, great. Thank you. Um uh, okay, so um in terms of what the direction the principles can go from here, um well, um I think. Uh, like you've mentioned, uh, the key is sort of like national implementation and operation, operationalization. So I think governments can um, sort of implement these principles in different ways. It could be to their own borrowing now lending practices, or it could be to their own borrowing practices. That could be sort of law passed by parliament, or it can um, just be sort of <clears throat> referencing the principles and adopting them into your specific uh, practices. Um, uh, that's one way to do it. Um, uh, of course, sort of, the, it takes political will to to achieve that. And uh, I think, for example, in Norway, there has always been sort of like a lot of popular pressure, and civil society has been quite instrumental in sort of building the pressure that has. Um, allowed for government to actually adopt these policies. So I think that's um, important. And um, also when it comes to sort of um, market-based ways to get private lenders on board. Um, uh, yeah, just to give one example from Norway again, I think that sort of like the, the mix of uh, hard law and soft law approaches is interesting and important because for example, with the sovereign wealth fund, um, they've taken sort of like a soft law such as uh, such as the UNTA principles and made it into more like a, a hard law um, and then uh, when the sovereign wealth fund follows their own principles and this ends up in sort of divestment or um, approval of different um, issuers of government bonds then these uh, activities uh, tend to be followed or uh, sort of inspire private investors to follow the same um, same path in this specific context is because private lenders in Norway know that the sovereign wealth fund put down a lot of resources into sort of their um, uh, when they research companies and they end up in a divestment from a specific company that has uh, conducted uh, unethical or um, unresponsible conduct. Um, they know that this divestment this divestment can be followed um, and they can sort of uh, trust the sovereign wealth funds uh, work because they know they put so much energy and resources into the groundwork for this divestment. So then it's followed by a lot of private investors. So I think that's one way of getting private lenders on board is trying to get this positive spillover effects. And um, um, yeah. And also there are different ways. I think, for example, it's important to mention the UK and New York, where you have these central jurisdictions, there are different things that can be done on a national level. 
it could be uh, collective action clauses in the law contracts. It can be anti-vulture fund laws, uh, such as has been mentioned in Belgium and UK. Uh, it could be different laws passed that creating moratoriums that deter vulture funds from litigating countries for a non-repayment in a debt distress situation. Um, it could also be uh, things that are, well, laws that provide sort of transparency through making um, uh, requirements for binding obligatory um, disclosure of information on loan contracts. Um, so there can be different ways to use national laws to sort of implement these principles in practice. Um, and then that will have, uh, that will sort of govern private investors conduct um, through through hard law, but also then, of course, soft law and um, just building sort of like a general enthusiasm around the concept of responsibility and, and sort of the more volunteer uh, solutions that private lenders can themselves adopt in their own frameworks and their own due diligence systems. Yeah, so I could say more about this, but just very briefly, uh, since we're running out of time. Thank you so much, Thea. I think you you have covered a lot of ideas for us there in terms of actually not only voluntary participation by the private sector and ways in which one can kind of crowd them into the space, uh, perhaps create examples, uh, but also actually um, convert the soft law into hard law um, in certain instances. I mean, I think the issue that has been raised several times today is this issue of the common framework. And we know that there is a huge problem in um, assuming that there will be comparality uh, of treatment um, and that in fact it is the borrowing country that has to ensure that, which makes it very hard in a world where lenders have not necessarily thought about responsible lending. So um, there is much I think that we can learn from today's session. I think it was dynamic and exciting. Thank you very much to everyone who raised questions and who participated. Um, I trust that we can have further discussions of this kind. Um, it is only when we engage with you who are engaged uh, at the front line of these issues um, that we can actually expand our learning at UNCTAD. So thank you very much to everyone. Uh, thank you very much to the speakers. Um, I think we have all um, enriched each other. So thank you so much. Um, may I wish you all a good afternoon, evening or morning. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And please don't forget to fill in the survey. Thank you. <laughs>